story opens on a dark and creepy full moonlit night. The main six plus Spike are wandering around a creepy old graveyard. Naturally, Rainbow Dash is trying to take advantage of the situation by acting scary, telling the others that this would be the perfect place to tell some scary stories, and Applejack is telling Rainbow to knock it off. Flutter she then asks Twilight to remind her again why they have to be in a creepy old graveyard in the middle of the night. Twilight reminds the others that Princess Celestia you sent them there to meet some Epony making a special delivery of absolute importance. Spike latching himself onto Twilight's leg wishes that they could have had the meeting place be somewhere else. Rarity agrees with Spike and tells about how filthy and percent have this place is, complaining that the groundskeeper really needs to do a better job. Naturally Pinkie Pie tries to make light of the situation by trying something weird like I don't know make a puppet show out of nothing but some sticks, leaves, vines and percent moss or something. Then when Pinkie turns around, Rainbow Dash wearing a changeling face mask goes blue. Scaring Pinky so bad that she jumps up and percent down through a cloud in the sky leaving two holes in the shape of her body which if positioned right would be a great opportunity for Pinkie Pie to break the fourth wall right in front of the audience. Then Rainbow takes off the mask and percent starts laughing hard at that. The others are all frustrated at RD right now. Then as RD is enjoying the moment, a wisp of smoke-like shadow comes out of the ground right behind her. Then it forms a dark goblin sneaking towards Rainbow. The others see the creature behind Rainbow and percent try to warn her, but they're so freaked out that they can't even say a word. So they keep pointing to the monster behind Rainbow. Rainbow is confused saying come on girls, it wasn't that bad. A second later she asks what's up with you guys. Then another second later she figures it out and says there's something bad right behind me isn't there. She turns around, then she freaks out while zipping away from the dark goblin as it slashes its claws and percent turns her changeling mask to shreds. Our heroes then try avoiding the goblin's attacks. Suddenly a strange glowing disc-like object comes flying towards the goblin, then when it hits the goblin it turns to smoke and percent evaporates into nothing. The disc-like object then passes through the smoke a second time, then it stops right beside the face of a mysterious figure Claymore, and once it stops we see that it's a four-pointed shuriken throwing star being held by levitation magic with a platinum-colored aura. The ponies then gasp at the mysterious imposing figure, then at a close-up of Claymore's face all he says is run, then flutter she begins flying away while saying you don't have to tell me twice. But before she can escape more dark goblins appear above her, then she squeals and percent heads back down, then several more dark goblins appear all around the ponies, play more leaps in and everyone forms a circle looking at the swarm of goblins as they keep coming closer and percent closer. Applejack asks what the hey are these things? Rarity says ghost, Spike says zombies, then Claymore answers Dark Goblins, then as the goblins begin their attack we see Pinky saying dee da do dee do dee Dark Goblins. And as she shouts Dark Goblins, she has her hooves placed on her cheeks in the style of Macaulay Culkin, in Home Alone, then we cut to the opening sequence. At the end of the opening sequence we see a slash effect that returns us to right where we left off with Pinkie Pie, who then takes her hooves off her face and says wait, what's a Dark Goblin? Applejack then replies I don't think I wanna find out. Claymore then starts blasting some goblins with his horn and percent says get out of here now. The main six try to flee but they're completely surrounded and percent rarity says there's nowhere to run. Rainbow Dash then plops her hooves together and percent says then we'll just have to make a way. Then our heroes try to hit the goblins but they move too fast and keep shifting from solid to shadow to solid again and percent again. Applejack states it's like trying to buck against the wind. Then suddenly one of the goblins phases into Spike's body then possesses him. Pike then grows twice his size, becomes very dark shaded, has a black aura emanating from his body, gets longer claws, fangs and percent spines, and his eyes are glowing red, then Spike turns to his friends and percent starts acting like a feral beast, Twilight says Spike, what happened to you, play more than says he's being possessed, play more than leaps into the air and percent then punches Spike with his hoof, knocking the real Spike out of the possessed Spike, then the dark goblin that was possessing him evaporates into nothing. The girls then gasp at what they saw. Then Spike gets up, rubbing his nose and says, Oh, what did you do? Play more than punches another dark goblin behind him. Then holds up his other hoof pointing at Spike Ampersand says Iron Ampersand silver laced horseshoes. Rarity then asks Iron Ampersand silver. 
play more than pulls out his special chain ampers and magically unhooks seven of the links and places each link on the tails of the main six ampers and spike while saying they're vulnerable to those two metals. As long as you're wearing iron and slash or silver they can't possess you. He then levitates out his two swords, makes a serious pose ampers and says now stand back. Then he charges in with both swords swinging too fast for the eyes to follow, galloping around at ninja speed. Slashing goblin after goblin, leaving nothing but a trail of evaporating smoke in his path, whittling down dozens of goblins, as they watch this twilight makes a slight angry face. Then as Claymore slashes the last goblin that's currently in his path, Twilight magically pulls Claymore by the tail towards her, then she says are you crazy, you just slice tempers and dice those guys, then another dark goblin starts coming towards Twilight from right behind her, but she doesn't notice because she's too busy lecturing Claymore by saying you can't just go around turning living things into a toast salad. Then Claymore takes his sword ampers and plunges it towards Twilight Then Twilight dodges the sword just in time to have it stab the goblin right behind her. Claymore then pulls back his sword ampers and lectures Twilight by saying these are shadow-based entities, physical manifestations of pure dark magic, they were never alive to begin with. Then he channels his own magic through his sword to light it up like a Star Wars-style lightsaber, then swipes it to unleash an energy wave similar to the Star Saber from Transformers trying to take down even more dark goblins right behind himself without even moving a muscle or looking away from Twilight's face. Then he says and don't ever pull me by the tail again, got it? Then Twilight says in a frightened manner yes, then as the others gather around Twilight, Playmore says more are coming, then as more goblins rise up Playmore then says got to get them into a confined space, he then tells the others what they have to do, he splits them in teams of two to herd the goblins in a certain direction so they can drive the goblins into a small alley in a nearby town, RD, Ampers and Flutter she keep the goblins from flying away, while AJ, Spike, Pinky Ampers and Rarity herd the goblins from the left Ampers and right, and Twilight is watching Playmore's back as the goblins follow them, then as T Ampers and Playmore come to the dead end of the alley Playmore places a spell on walls Ampers and ground to make it so that the goblins can't just face through anything and he then grabs Twilight Ampers and high jumps them both up onto the rooftops. Then as they get all the goblins together the ponies barricade the exit to the alley pining the goblins against the wall, then Twilight asks Playmore what now? Then Claymore says now this. Claymore then uses his unicorn magic to quickly raise the sun into the perfect position to destroy all of the dark goblins at one time at least for now. Then when the last of those goblins evaporate, Claymore then quickly sets the sun back down. After which the main six Ampers and Spike gather around Claymore Ampers and are all seriously surprised by what he just did. Then Twilight asks did you just raise Ampers and set the sun? Then Claymore says Claymore, everyone then says ha. Huh. Then Claymore says my name, it's Claymore, Rainbow then says Claymore, you mean like the sword, Claymore, Claymore then replies what tipped you off, then Pinky tries telling ways that would have tipped them off that his name refers to sword, then Claymore uses his magic to close Pinky's mouth and percent states clearly someone doesn't know what rhetorical means, Twilight then asks how could you control the sun like that, Claymore replies practice, this wasn't my first time, then Twilight starts getting frustrated and percent says that's not what I meant, what makes you capable of that? Rarity then bots in asking don't take this the wrong way or anything but could it possibly have something to do with the fact that you are a unicorn with two horns? Playmore then shows his teeth in frustration and says it's Tonicorn, Applejack the says eh, to Nicorn, because of your two horns. Playmore then says do you always take the obvious? Slaughter she then asks why those things attack them, Playmore then opens up one of his pouches and levitates out a small round bell that's black and emanating a black aura, and shows it to the others while saying they were after this, Rainbow then says a bell, we went through all of that, just for a bell, Playmore then explains not just a bell, a dark soul bell, one of a set of 13 that if all brought together, will bring forth Armageddon, Pinky then says you're a getting, what? Spike then says no pinky, Armageddon, it means the end of world, Claymore then says I wouldn't need to explain that to you if you were the elite guards I told Celestia to send, Twilight then asks oh, so then that's the delivery she sent up to pick up, Claymore angrily says pick up, I specifically told Celestia this was an escort job, then he puts the bell back into his pouch while saying this bell doesn't leave me until I'm looking Celestia right in the eyes, Twilight then says wait, seriously what's going on here? Claymore then says Tambellon is returning, and with it, the necromancer, the others look confused Ampers and Rainbow says Nequat. Then the scene transfers over to Cantor literally the next morning.
where we hear Celeste angrily saying how many times have I told you not to take control of the sun without my permission. Then we see Claymore saying when you're up against a swarm of dark goblins you don't have time for asking permission. Celeste then says you know I have certain responsibilities that I cannot take lightly. Claymore then says you should have thought of that before you sent a bunch of kids to meet me. Rainbow then bots in and says hey we're not kids, we've saved worlds several times, and Pinky adds and a couple of other worlds as well. Celeste then continues her argument with Claymore as she says you were supposed to give the package to them. Claymore then says Tambellon is returning Celeste, and you need to be ready. Celeste says I'm well aware of what is going on. Then Claymore gets right up in her face and says well then you need to start acting like you are and get serious. Celeste then pulls away from Claymore and says do you have the bell? Claymore then magically pulls out the bell and purse and hands it over to Celeste. Celeste then locks the bell in a special safe while saying the bell will be secure within this magic dampening safe which dampens the powers of magical objects from the inside only. Then suddenly the safe is magically ripped out of the wall, and Celeste shouts hey. Then we see Claymore levitating the safe then he shrinks it down to the size of a honeydew melon, then stores it into one of his pouches, and says your safe will be safer with me. But as he starts walking out the door, the royal guards stop Claymore for his actions telling him hope. Claymore then says to Celeste without even looking at her you know you can't stop me, so don't even try to hold me back. Celeste then makes a frustrated expression and says royal guard, stand down. One of the guards then says ha, huh, but your majesty, then Celeste interrupts and says in a very serious tone stand down. Then the royal guard step aside and let Claymore go, and he just walks out saying that's better. The main six and Spike then gather around Celeste and Rainbow Dash says oh, I can't believe that guy. Twilight then says how could you just let him talk to you like that Empress and just get away with it. Celeste then says one, he's more powerful than me, two, it's not his fault he's like this, and third, he's our only hope of stopping the threat of Tambellon. Twilight then asks what is Tambellon anyways. Celeste then says Tambellon is an ancient disappearing city that returns every few centuries, and when it returns so does the necromancer that was imprisoned within it. Pinky then asks what's a necromancer. Celeste then says a necromancer is a being that wields powerful dark magic to summon empress and control supernatural or paranormal creatures to do their bidding, such as ghosts, zombies, vampires or werewolves, some even summon other worldly demons, and of all the necromancers ever to exist, none have ever been more of a threat than the one known as Kroger. Just the sound of his name makes Slaughter she gulp in fear. Celeste then continues those dark goblins you face were but a few of Kroger's minions and there's bound to be a lot more of them later on. Only the Tonicorns have ever been able to defeat Kroger his dark goblin hordes. So Claymore has a very important role to play in all of this. Twilight then says forgive me for sounding ignorant Celeste, but I've never even heard of a Tonicorn until now. Celeste then says I'm not surprised, because the Tonicorns are extinct. Rarity then says extinct. You mean there? Then Celeste box in and says gone, all gone. Claymore is the only one left, the very last of his kind. Applejack then asks what then what happened to all the other Tonicorns. Celeste then takes out a large stone tablet with a big octagon shaped gemstone in the center, sets it on a nearby table and says this ancient tablet contains the complete history of the Tonicorn tribe. She then waves her hoof across it, then the gem starts to glow and it then displays the holographic presentation of the story Celeste is about to reveal. As the presentation plays forth, Celeste narrates slash explains what's going on. We then hear Celeste saying the following as you may know our wood is full of magical equines, such as Earth Ponies, who have magically ingrained connection to the very earth we walk upon Empress and depend on for survival, Pegasi, who can fly, walk on clouds Empress and manage weather, Unicorns, who can control mystical forces Empress and cast spells, Olicorns, who can fly cast stronger spells than most unicorns, even zebras possess a unique magic of their very own, but the one species of equine that doesn't possess any magic whatsoever, is the donkey, and 5000 years ago this known fact aggravated one particular donkey known only as Bray, Bray despised all ponies for having magic while he had none, and he despised himself even more for being a donkey because he had no magic, to rectify this, Bray decided to read Empress and study as much about magic as he possibly could. Eventually his studies led to a discovery that could grant him more magical might than he could ever imagine. Bray then gathered the necessary objects, 
as well as a set of 13 small round brass bells, then he performed a special ritual that allowed him to pierce through dimensional barriers, enabling him to reach out to well known as the Dark Dimension, a universe composed entirely out of dark magic, ravaged into an endless void by its own inhabitants, the Dark Goblins, the race of mindless, savage, paranatural monsters made completely out of dark magic, who tore their own world apart piece by piece. Ray was able to tap into the primal forces that make up the Dark Dimension, then transferred its power into the 13 Brass Bell, turning them into a set of 13 Dark Soul Bells brimming with unspeakably powerful dark magic. Upon placing all 13 Dark Soul Bells on a collar and purse and wearing it around his neck, Ray was granted incredible dark magical powers, but it all came at a tragic cost. His body was forever transformed from that of a regular old donkey to that of a large big horn ram that could no longer age, and his mind was warped to focus only on his deepest, darkest, most evil for tempers and magnify them exponentially. Not only could he wield all that dark magic, but he also gained complete control over all of the dark goblins from the dark dimension, and was able to summon them into our world through miniature black holes. It was on that day that Ray the donkey was no more, all that was left in his place was Groger the Necromancer. Soon Groger began using his dark powers to terrorize entire cities, sending out dark goblins to attack innocent bystanders. What made the dark goblins so dangerous was the fact that they could possess any living creature or inanimate object, transforming them into horrible monsters completely under Groger's control, as though they were mere extensions of his own will. Fortunately, since the dark goblins were beings of dark magic, they could not survive in direct sunlight, so Groger could only strike at night or would have to form dark clouds to block out the sun so his goblins could survive. To resolve this problem, Kroger decided to utilize the full extent of all 13 of his dark soul bells to forge a massive black hole capable of pulling our entire planet into the dark dimension, so the sun would never shine on the earth ever again, and all of the dark goblins in existence could roam the earth all the time with no limitations. Everything in our world would fall under Kroger's complete control. Only one force was able to stop him, one species of equine whose magic surpassed even that of licorns, the tonicorns. Since the Tonicorns have two horns instead of just one, they possess a stronger connection to all of the mystical forces that make up our world, giving them a special form of extrasensory perception often referred to as a Tonicorn sense, that they are able to use as a magical form of echolocation to detect certain types of magic. This also allows them to be able to sense all forms of magic and any shifts in the magic around them. The higher the level of magic they can wield, the farther amper and better they can sense mystical forces, they can even sense things that neither unicorn nor licorn could sense, from the faintest forms of magic to the strongest, tonicorns could sense them even from all around the world, including supernatural and paranormal forces, this made them seen as a threat to supernatural slash paranormal beings, so the tonicorns were continuously being hunted down by monsters ampers and demons, but they had more than enough magic to fight back. So the Tonicorns took on the responsibility of protecting our work from supernatural slash paranormal evils. The Tonicorns could also sense that nearly all supernatural slash paranormal creatures had three common weaknesses, sunlight and the two minerals known as iron ampers and silver. So the Tonicorns created a special magical forge that could melt any material and use it to smith more valuable crafts. Since the fort was magic, its fire could only be lit through magic. It would only take a tiny amount of tonicorn magic to ignite its flame, but it would take a moderate amount of licorn magic to lit it, and an enormous amount of unicorn magic to lit it. The tonicorns used this forge to smith weapons and percent armor made using iron, silver, and other various materials to help them better combat supernatural slash paranormal adversaries. But because the tonicorns were targeted by so many dangerous forces, they decided for the betterment of all innocent bystanders, they had to isolate themselves from any other beings, to keep everything else safe from evil forces beyond their control, taking nearly all evidence of their very existence with them. Ultimately the tonicorns became a secret race of equine, no pony even realized they were still around, until the day Groger became an apocalyptic level threat, then the tonicorns could no longer remain a secret, for the future of the earth itself. They had no choice but to reveal themselves and take on Groger his endless army of dark goblins. The Tonicorns fought long, hard, and valiantly. Soon enough they managed to deliver a tactical blow to Groger that made him lose eight of his thirteen dark soul bells. The Tonicorns then confiscated those eight dark soul bells. With his power greatly diminished, Groger had no other choice but to flee into the abandoned city of Tambellon.
Once their Gogur got to the center of the city, he made a last stand and used the power he still had to continuously summon army after army of dark goblins. The Tonicorns knew they couldn't get Gogur out of the city, so they decided to leave him there. Under their terms, the Tonicorns entered the city's ceremonial giant bell, and while most of the Tonicorns kept the dark goblins at bay, some of the more powerful ones used the full extent of their power to tap into the primal forces that make up our own world, and used them to transform the ceremonial bell into a light soul bell that would counteract Kroger's dark magic. The Tonicorns then all worked together to place a curse on the city of Tambellon. Upon ringing the light soul bell, the entire city was exiled from our world Empress and sent into the dark dimension taking Kroger along with it, thus putting an end to the threat of Kroger for now, after which the Tonicorns vanished back into the shadows as mysteriously as they came. They soon enough disappeared into legends Empress and myths. Even Starswell the Bearded knew very little about the Tonicorns. The Tonicorns entered the eight dark soul bells they confiscated from Groger and Persen scattered them across the globe, hiding them in places they thought would be safe. Though over the centuries other beings had found some of the dark soul bells and Persen used their dark power to fulfill their own dark desires. But our world had not seen the last of Kroger. It turns out that the curse that the Tonicorns had placed on Tambellon was only powerful enough to last for only 500 years. And when Tambellon returned, so did Kroger. He then began sending out dark goblins to wreak havoc across the lands. So the Tonicorns were called back into action. They held off the dark goblins long enough to ring the light soul bell again to renew the curse they had first put on Tambellon, thus sending the city and Kroger back into the dark dimension. From then on out, once every 500 years Tambellon would return to our world bringing Kroger back along with it, then the Tonicorns would return to fend off against his dark goblin horde, then ring the light soul bell again to renew the curse, and send Kroger and the city of Tambellon back into the dark dimension for another 500 years. But Wily Kroger would not take this lying down, and came up with a devious plan. When Tambellon returned about 1000 years ago, Kroger sent a multitude of his dark goblins underground, spreading them across the globe. The dark goblins traveled to various areas that were already filled with a sublime amount of dark energies. The goblins then went into a hibernative state that produced the presence of their dark magic, making them too faint to be detected amongst the dark energies that already surrounded them, making them act as Kroger's sleeper agents. And when Tambellon was sent back to the Dark Dimension, Kroger's Dark Goblin sleeper agents remained in our world waiting the next time Tambellon would return. And right before Tambellon returned 500 years ago, the Dark Goblins off open to perform a surprise attack and percent steal the Light Soul Bell and bring it into Tambellon to be guarded by Kroger's forces. Without the Light Soul Bell the Tonicorns could not send Tambellon back to the Dark Dimension. This left Kroger ample opportunity to spread more of his Dark Goblins out across the lands. During that time the goblins were able to recover six of Kroger's eight missing dark soul bells and bring them back to him. With each of his dark soul bells returned to him Kroger kept regaining more ampers and more of his lost power. The Tonicorns knew that they could not allow Kroger to be restored to his full power. So they did the only thing they could do. Every last Tonicorn in world young ampers and old gathered together. They all then went into Tambellon to battle against Kroger's forces. Until one of them managed to reach the light soul bell, they then committed the ultimate sacrifice. Upon ringing the light soul bell, Kroger and the city of Tambellon was sent back into the dark dimension, taking all of the Tonicorns along for the ride. The Tonicorns could not have survived in the hostile world of the dark dimension for very long, so it was presumed that the Tonicorns became extinct. But before they even left for Tambellon they did not leave our world completely defenseless against any supernatural slash paranormal threat that would rise in their absence. They left all of their vast knowledge of powerful magic, this very tablet containing information about their history and their magic forge so that other ponies could smith weapons and percent armor for their own protection. But since it takes very powerful magic to ignite the forge's flame, only I had sufficient enough magic to light it at the time. So for centuries I've had a forge stored in the basement of Canterlot Castle. Since that time all other ponies of all types had to defend their world against the supernatural slash paranormal. And there have been many victories and percent casualties along the way. But there was still the matter of what to do when Tambellon would return the next time. Without the Tonicorns all hope seemed lost. Until about 200 years ago, when an Arctic exploration team came across a miraculous discovery, the frozen young Tonicorn Colt who didn't even have his QT mark yet, perfectly preserved in the Arctic ice for who knows how long, the Tonicorn Colt was then brought back to the mainland, where he was thought out, then reanimation spell was used to awaken him, 
Due to the fact that he was frozen alive for an unknown amount of time, the Tonicorn Cove lost all of his memories. He could not remember where he came from, who his family was, or how he got frozen in the first place. He couldn't even his own name. The Tonicorn Cove was later brought before the Cosmic Council as mentioned in the MLP storybook under the sparkling sea, which I assume is similar to the United Nations in the real world, to decide what should be done about him. Since he was perhaps the only Tonicorn left in all existence, we knew that as long as one of them was still around, there would still be hope of defeating Broker the next time Tambellon would return. Unfortunately, seeing as how supernatural paranormal threats were already at an all-time high, matters had to be taken immediately if not sooner. It was decided by the Council that the young Tonicorn had to become combat ready as soon as possible. The Council decided that to help speed up the process. He was to be forbidden from all forms of childish distractions, to be isolated from normal society, never allowed to interact with everyday ordinary civilians, cut off from all attachments of friendship, love or emotions, to focus solely on becoming a force against evil. Naturally I was against that decision, but it was majority overruled. Since then the Tonicorn Cove was sent all over the world, being forced to train in every known form of the mystic arts, the martial arts, and weapons handling, being trained by the greatest masters in the world including myself, and since he was a Tonicorn he could not only perform all of these forms of magic exceptionally, but could take them to levels we didn't even know were possible, presumably because we still knew very little of what Tonicorn magic was truly capable of, once he even showed me that he learned how to control the sun and moon from just watching me do it, though he was able to control them even better than I ever could by myself. He was even able to perform various tricks with them. Naturally, I got on him about that, telling him not to do things like that because I had to maintain order in my responsibilities. But I do admit I was seriously impressed that someone so young could have so much power, making me realize that there was a lot more to Tonicorn's true potential than I could ever imagine. All day every day, the young Tonicorn did nothing but eat, train, sleep, train, bathe, and percent train some more. Oftentimes he was disciplined for not taking his training seriously, or getting distracted for childish things. It was a lot of pressure to put on one so young, but being the last of the Tonicorns brought him a lot of burdens that he never even asked for. But given the circumstances he had no other choice, though I did try my best to become the closest thing he would have had to a friend. But I was only allowed to go so far based on the council's decision. That little cove went through a lot of psychologically traumatic events that no fool should ever have to experience. During his weapons training he proved to be very adept to sword wielding. When he later received his QT mark, it was a coat of arms made of a set of swords. After that happened I suggested to the council that we start addressing the Tonicorn Colt as Claymore, because of his connections to swords. The council agreed and from then on the Colt was named Claymore. All of his training and percent psychological traumas led to him developing certain emotional instabilities, such as excessive rage, hostility, and severe azicial traits. But ultimately most of the council thought it was all worth it, for he had also became a hard-boiled, fearless, tough as nails combatant, ready to take down anything that got in his way. When he reached his later teens, we used the Tonicorn's magic forge to smith a special set of weapons and percent gear made specifically for him, which included a pair of double-edged swords, a set of three dozen hero shuriken throwing stars, a special chain that can only be linked through powerful enough magic, and his own set of horseshoes, all made using a perfect mixture of iron, silver and percent dragon's tooth because dragons can't chew diamonds it's safe to assume that dragon teeth are the hardest known substance in the pony world. To not only guarantee that they would be able to dispel supernatural slash paranormal forces, but so they would also be unbreakable now the swords themselves look like a pair of double-edged Chinese Jian slash Japanese Tsuruji slash Korean Jian straight swords. Other than being indestructible and percent deadly to supernatural slash paranormal creatures they are not all that special, but in Flamor's possession he can channel his Tonicorn magic through them to light them up like asterisk star or asterisk style lightsabers with just as powerful slashes, and can swipe them to unleash destructively powerful energy waves similar to Kirby slash me tonight asterisk or beams from the asterisk Kirby asterisk video game franchise, or Optimus Prime star saber slash Megatron dark star saber from Asterisk Transformers Prime Asterisk, so don't underestimate this speed of swords, 
since then Flame War became one of our world's greatest warriors, who traveled all across the globe protecting us from evil forces that threatened to conquer or destroy us all. He was even taught how to use the age spell, to keep himself young and percent vital so that no matter how old he got, he would always remain at the top of his game, which he will need to be at for when Thambelen makes its return, so he will be able to face off against Kroger. Then the hollow display and then the tablet detonates. Celestia then says to our heroes, so now you know the truth about Playmore, and what is at stake here? Everyone remains quiet for about two to three seconds, then Spike says, wow, no wonder why that Playmore guy is such a jerk. Flutter she then says, oh age age, per Playmore, can you imagine having to go through all of that as a mere fool? It must have been just horrible for him. Pinky then says, yeah, I don't blame the guy, I'd be meanie MC grumpy pants myself if I never even got a chance to just be a kid empress and make some friends. Celestia then adds, indeed, Playmore has never had any friends, and I doubt he'll ever want to have any friends at all. Then Twilight makes a look in her face like she has something on her mind but doesn't want to talk about it. Applejack then asks, so if this Thambelan place is returning, when's it supposed to get here? Celestia then says tonight at dusk, everyone gasps. Celestia then says exactly, that is why we must locate the other Dark Soul Bell before the Dark Goblins find it, so we can keep Kroger from obtaining it, and prevent him from regaining his full power. Everyone then realizes the seriousness of the situation and Twilight then asks where's Claymore now. Celestia then shows them, she takes them to a balcony and points to the highest roof at the highest point in all of the castle, where we see Playmore lying on his knees and in a zen-like state of meditation, and he's sending out these transparent waves from his horns, Rarity asks what is he doing all the way up there. Then Celestia says since Claymore has already identified the form of magic from the Dark Soul Bell recently recovered, he is most likely using his unicorn sense to try and find the only other one left. Asks, so why is he doing it way up there? Celestia says the bell is most likely well hidden, and giving off only a very faint magical presence, so the higher the elevation, the less interference from other forms of magic he can detect. Twilight then asks what can he really pull off something like that? Celestia replies if any penny can, it's him, hopefully he'll find it soon, for time is of the essence. Then Claymore opens his eyes, then he gets up, then leaps around the rooftops ninja style, then lands on the balcony with Celestia the others. He then says I found the final Dark Soul Bell, it's in the place now known as, the Crystal Empire. Everyone then lets out a ha. Spike then asks what would the Dark Soul Bell be doing in the Crystal Empire? Celestia then replies you have to remember that Punicorn scattered the Dark Soul Bells across the globe millennia ago. Most likely the Crystal Empire was built right on top of its location without any pun even knowing about it. Claymore then says if they didn't before, they're about to find out once I get there. Celestia then says the only train leaving for the Crystal Empire is leaving in a few minutes. If you hurry you can make it. Then Claymore doesn't say a word and just leaps off the balcony and keeps leaping on ampersand off and running on rooftops until he reaches the train empress and lands on top of it riding on the roof of the train so he can skip getting a ticket. Then we see the others having seen that from the balcony telescope. Then Rainbow says in a surprised manner so, awesome. Twilight then says don't worry Princess Celestia, we won't let you down. Celestia then says no Twilight, this is no longer your concern. If I had known that the Dark Goblins had already returned I never would have gotten you and your friends involved. This is something you must let Claymore handle alone. Everyone then shouts what? Rainbow then says ah, uh, no offense Princess what come on, you're talking to the team that down Lord Tyrick here. Celestia says I'm well aware of that, but you were not my first choice to stop him. The truth is, that once I learned that Tyrick began making trouble, the first one I would have turned to for help was Claymore. Unfortunately at that time he was busy in the Griffin Nation trying to prevent the evil otherworldly deity C-T-H-U-L-H-U from entering our dimension and turning everyone in this world into his tentacle slaves. Long story namely someone in the Griffin Nation tried to use the Grimoire known as the Necronomicon to try and summon C-T-H-U-L-H-U into the ponies dimension, and Claymore had to take care of that before C-T-H-U-L-H-U arrived and percent started turning everyone in their world into monsters known as Shagats, so he was too busy to handle Tyrek, but I'm getting off topic here, so I had to go with Discord, when that didn't work I had no other choice but to get Twilight involved, Twilight then says wait, so, I was your third choice to handle Tyrek, 
Then Celestia says I'm sorry Twilight, but Claymore is the best choice for this, it's what he was trained for in the first place. Now if you'll excuse me, I must prepare for Grover's imminent return, then Celestia walks out the door. Twilight then tells the others to come with her, then they'll run out of the castle, as they're running Rarity asks where they're going, Twilight then says we're going to follow Claymore, then Pinky asks why didn't Princess Celestia just tell us to not get involved in this. Twilight replies I know what she said, but this is one time I have to get involved. Flutter she then says ah Twilight, I think that Claymore is more than capable of handling this all by himself. Twilight then replies look, I'd hate to admit this, but Claymore Ampers and I are actually a lot alike. Applejack then asks what incarnation are you talking about please? Twilight explains when I was just a filly growing up as Celestia's prize student, I became so obsessed with learning magic that I refused to be social with others. I wasn't in the least bit interested in making friends. Heck, when I first came to Ponyville I was way more interested in researching about the elements of harmony and didn't think making friends was important. But that all changed when I realized that friendship was the most important form of magic there is. It's basically the reason I became a princess in the first place. But the big difference between the ampersand play more is that back then I chose to be as a show just so I had more time to learn ampersand study. But Playmore was never given that choice. He was forced to become as a show against his will, just because there was no one else who could take on all of the responsibilities of the Tonicorns. Everyone just looks at Twilight wondering if she's trying to make a point. Twilight then says look, no one should have to go through the things Claymore went through, every pony deserves a chance to make friends, and I vow by my title as the princess of friendship asterisk, that's exactly what I'll give him, Rainbow Dash then asks and just how are you going to do that exactly, then Twilight answers by making Claymore accept me as his friend, Twilight is convinced that if she can get someone as as a shlampers and badass as Claymore to embrace the magic of friendship and accept her as a friend, it would be one of her greatest accomplishments since earning her princessly title, so she pretty much has her work cut out for her, but hey if Slaughter she could convince Discord to go from bad to good, then Twilight can do this, Spike then says I don't know Twilight, don't you think you're aiming a little high here, Twilight then answers of course not Spike, if I've learned anything it's that nothing is impossible when you have the magic of friendship on your side, and right now Claymore needs that magic more than any pony else, Rarity then says well if you're planning to accomplish that, then we'd better get on that train immediately, then the main 6% spike board the train just before it's about to leave.